Okay, we're now going into the technical deep dive. We're going to geek out here a little bit. Benoit Dajaville is here. He's co-founder of Snowflake and president of products. And also joining us is Christian Kleinerman, who's the senior vice president of products. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you. Yeah, nice to see you, Dave. Good to see you, Dave. Thanks for having us. Yeah, very yeah. welcome. So Benoit, we, we've heard a lot this morning about the data cloud and it's becoming, in my view anyway, the linchpin of your strategy. I'm interested in what technical decisions you made early on that, that led you to this point and even enabled the data cloud. Yeah, so, so, so I would say that the data cloud was built into in three phases, really. The initial phase, as, as you, you call it, was was really Team, about twenty minutes. One region uh, close to of the days. data cloud, and 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 that region. What, what was important is to make that region infinite, infinitely scalable, right? And that's our architecture, which we call the multi-cluster shared data architecture, such that you can plug in as many workloads in in that region as 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 without any limits. The limit is really the underlying you know, cloud provider you know resources. Uh, which you know, a, a cloud provider region has, 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 has really no limits. So, so that's you know, region architecture. I think was really the building block of the Snowflake Data Cloud. But it really didn't stop there. The, the, the second aspect was, was was really data sharing. How you know, multi tenants within a region, how to share data between tenants of that region, between different customers. Uh, and, and that was also enabled by our architecture because we decouple, you know, compute and, and storage. So sto a compute, you know, clusters can access any storage within a region. Uh, so that's phase two of, of the data cloud. And, and then really phase three, which is critical is the expansion, the global expansion, how we made, you know, uh, our cloud diagnostic layer so that we could port, you know, a Snowflake region on different clouds uh, and now we are running in free, you know, cloud uh, on, on top of free cloud providers. We started with AWS in US West, and we moved to Azure and then uh, 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 Google GCP. Uh, and how this this cloud region? We, we we started with one cloud region, as I said, in AWS in US West, and and then we create we created you know many you know different regions. We have twenty two regions today. Uh, all over the world and all over the different you know, cloud providers. And, and what's more important is that these regions are not isolated. You know, Snowflake is one single you know, system for the world where we created this global data mesh, which connects every region such that not only the Snowflake system as a whole can, can be aware of all these regions, but customers can you know, replicate data across regions. Uh, and, 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 you know, share data, you know, across the, the planet if, if needs be. So, so this is one single, you know, really, I, I call it the World Wide Web of, of data. And that, that's, you know, is this vision of the data cloud. And it really started with this building block, which is a cloud region. Thank you for that, Benoit. Christian, you and I have talked about this. I mean, that notion of stripping away the complexity and that's kind of what the data cloud does. But if you think about data architectures historically, they've, they've, they've really had no domain knowledge. They've really been focused on the technology to ingest and analyze and prepare and then you know, push data out to the business. And you're really flipping that model, allowing the sort of domain leaders to be first-class citizens, if you will. Uh, and because the, they're the ones that are creating data value and, and they're worrying less about infrastructure, but I wonder, do you feel like customers are, are ready for that change? Uh, I, I love the observation, Dave, that uh, so much energy goes in, in, in enterprises, in organizations today, just dealing with infrastructure and dealing with pipes and plumbing and things like that. And something that was uh, insightful from, from Benoit and, and, and our founders from, from day one was, this is a managed service. We want our customers to focus on the data, getting the insights, getting the decisions in time, not just managing pipes and plumbing and patches and upgrades. And, and the, the other piece that is, it's, it's an interesting reality is that there, there's this belief that the cloud is simplifying this and all of a sudden there's no problem. But actually understanding each of the public cloud providers is a large undertaking, right? Uh, each of them have hundred plus services uh, sending upgrades and updates on a constant basis. And that just distracts from the time that it takes to go and say, 
here's my data, here's my data model, here's how I make better decisions. So at the heart of everything we do is we want to abstract the infrastructure, we want to abstract the nuance of each of the cloud providers. And as you said, have companies focus on this is the domain expertise or the knowledge for my industry. Are all companies ready for it? I, I think it's a, it's a mixed bag. We, we, we talk to customers uh, on a regular basis, every way, every week, every day. And some of them are full on, they've sort of burned the bridges and like, I'm going to the cloud, I'm going to embrace a new model. Uh, some others, you, you can see the complete like uh, uh, shock and awe expression. Like, what do you mean I don't have all these knobs to, to tweak and turn? Uh, but I, I think the, the future is very clear on how do we get companies to be more competitive through data. Well, ben, Benoit, it's interesting that Christian mentioned the managed service and that used to be in a hosting, guys running around a lab, lab coats and plugging things in. And, and of course you're looking at this differently. It's high degrees of automation, but you know, one of those areas is workload management. And, and I wonder how you think about workload management and how that changes with the data cloud. Yeah, this is a great question actually. Workload management used to be a nightmare, you know, on traditional systems. Uh, and it was a nightmare for, for DBAs and they had to spend most, a lot of their time, you know, just managing workloads. And, and why is that? It's because all these workloads are running on the single, you know, system and a single cluster. They compete for resources. So managing workload, I, I always explain it as, as playing Tetris, right? You had first to know when to run this workload, make sure that two big workloads are not overlapping, you know, maybe ETL is pushed at night, you know, and, and, and you have this nightly window, uh, which is not, you know, efficient, of course, for your ETL because you have delays because of that, but, but you have no choice, right? You have a fixed amount of resources and you have to, to get the best of, out of these fixed uh, resources. And, and for sure, you don't want your ETL workload to impact your, your, your dashboarding workload or your reports, you know, impact and with data science. And, and, and this became a true nightmare because, because everyone wants to be data driven, meaning that all the, the entire company wants to run new workloads on, on this system and these systems are completely, you know, overwhelmed. So, so workload management was a nightmare before Snowflake and, and Snowflake made it really easy. The reason is in Snowflake, we leverage the cloud to dedicate, you know, compute resources to each workload. It's in the Snowflake terminology, it's called a warehouse, virtual warehouse. And each workload can run on its own virtual warehouse and each virtual warehouse has its own dedicated compute resources. Uh, it's own, you know, IO bandwidth and you can really control how much resources each workload gets by sizing these warehouses you know, adjusting the compute resources that they, they, they can use. When a workload, you know, starts to execute automatically, the warehouse, the compute resources are turned off, by, turned on by, by Snowflake. It's called resuming a warehouse. And, and you can dynamically resize this warehouse. It can be done by the system automatically, you know, if, if the concurrency of the workload increases, or it can be done manually by the administrator, you know, just adjusting, you know, power compute power, you know, for each workload. And, and the best of, of, of that model is not only it, it gives you a very fine grain control on, on, on resources that each workload can get, not only workloads are not competing and not impacting it in any other workload, but because of that model, you can add as many workloads as you want. And, and that's, you know, really critical because as I said, you know, everyone in the organization wants to use data to make decisions. So you have more and more workloads running and playing this Tetris game, you know, would, would have been impossible in, 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 a, in a centralized, you know, one single compute cluster system. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side though, is that you have to have as, as, a, as an administrator of, of the system, you have to, to justify that the workload is worth running for your organization, right? It's so easy in, in, in literally in seconds, you can stand up a new warehouse and, and start to run your, your queries on that new compute cluster. And of course you have to justify it, the cost of that because there is a cost, right? Snowflake charges by seconds of compute. So that cost, you know, is it justified? And, and you have to, you know, it's so easy now to add new workload and new, do new things with Snowflake. That, that, that you have to, to see, you know, and, and look at the, 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 the trade-off of the cost, of, of course, and managing cost. 
So Christian uh, Benoit used the term nightmare. I'm thinking about you know, previous days of workload management. And I mean, I talked to a lot of customers that are trying to reduce the elapsed time of going from you know, data to insights. And their nightmare is they've got this complicated data life cycle. Uh, and, and I'm wondering how you guys think about that, that notion of compressing elapsed time to, to data value from raw data to insights. Yeah, so, so we, we obsess or we, we think a lot about this time to insight from the moment that uh, an event happens to the point that it shows up in a dashboard or a report or some decision or action happens based on it. There are three parts that, that we think on how do we reduce that life cycle. The first one, which ties to our, our previous conversation is related to where is their muscle memory on processes or ways of doing things that don't actually make as much sense. My favorite example is you say, uh, you ask any, any organization, do you run pipelines and ingestion and transformation at two and three in the morning? And the answer is, oh yeah, we do that. <laughs> and if you go in and say, why do you do that? The answer is typically, well, that's when the resources are available back to Benoit's Tetris, right? That's, that's when it was possible. But then you ask, would you really want to run it at two and three in the morning if, it, if, if, if you could do it sooner or you could do it more in time, real time with when the event happened? So first part of it is back to removing the constraints of the infrastructure is how about running transformations and data ingestion when the business best needs it, when it's the lowest time to insight, the lowest latency, not when the technology lets you do it. So that's the, the, the easy one out the door. The, the second one is instead of just fully optimizing a process, where can you remove steps of the process? This is where all of our data sharing and the Snowflake data marketplace come into place. How about if you need to go and ingest data from a SaaS application vendor, or maybe from a commercial uh, data provider? And imagine the, 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 the dream of you wouldn't have to be running uh, constant iterations and FTPs and cracking CSV files and things like that. What if it's always available in your environment, always up to date? And that in our mind is a lot more revolutionary, which is not, let's take away a, a process of ingesting and copying data and, and optimize it. How about not copying it in the first place? So yeah. that's vector number two. And then vector number three is, is what we do day in and day out on making sure our platform delivers the, the, the best performance, make it faster. The combination of those three things has led many of our customers and, 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 and you'll see it through many of the customer testimonials uh, today that they get insights and decisions and actions way faster in part by removing steps, in part by doing away with old habits and in part because we deliver uh, exceptional performance. Thank you, Christian. Now, Benoit, as you, as you know, we're big proponents of this idea of domain-driven design and, and data architecture. You know, for example, customers building entire applications and what I like to call data products or data services on their data platform. I wonder if you could talk about the types of applications and services that you're seeing built on top of Snowflake. Yeah, and, and I have to say that this is a critical aspect of Snowflake is to create this platform and, and really help application to be built on top of this platform. And, and, and the more application we have, the better the platform will be. It's, it's like, you know, the, the analogies with your iPhone, if your iPhone had no applications, you know, it would be useless. It, it, it's, it, it's an empty platform. So, so we are really encouraging, you know, applications to be built on top of Snowflake. And, and from day one, actually, uh, many applications and many of our customers are building applications on, on Snowflake. We estimated that about 30% are running already applications on, on top of our platform. And the reason is, is of course, because it's, it's so easy to get compute resources. There is no limit in, in scale, in availability, durability. So all these characteristics are critical for, for an application. Uh, 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 and, and we delivered that you know, from day one. Now we have improved you know, or increased the scope of, of the platform by adding you know, Java you know, computation and Snowpark, which, which was announced today. Uh, that also, you know, is, is an enabler. Uh, so in terms of, of type of application, it, it's, it's really, you know, all over and, and, and 
And and what I like actually is to be surprised, right? I don't know what will be being on top of Snowflake and how would we, it will be delivered. Uh, but with data sharing also, we are opening a door to a new type of applications which are delivered via the marketplace uh, 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 where, you know, one can get this application directly inside the platform, right? The platform is distributing this application. And, and today there was a, a presentation on, on in uh, um, uh, um, creation keynotes about, you know, quantifying, which, you know, is this machine learning, you know, which is provided to, you know, any users of, of, of Snowflake, of the application. And, and machine learning, you know, to find, you, you, you know, and, and, and apply model on, on your data and enrich your, 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 your data. So data enrichment, I think, will be a huge aspect of Snowflake and data enrichment with machine learning would be a big, you know, use case for these applications. Also, how to get data, you know, inside the platform, you know, a lot of applications will help you to do that. Uh, so machine learning, uh, data engineering, enrichments, uh, uh, all these are, are applications that we run on, on the platform. Great. Hey, we just got a, a minute or so left and earlier today we ran a video. We saw that you guys announced the startup competition, which is awesome. Uh, Benoit, you're a judge in this competition. What, what yeah. can you tell us about this? Yeah, first, I mean, I have to say that, you know, for me, we are still a startup. <laughs> I, I, I didn't, you know, yet, you know, realize that, that we are not anymore a startup. I, I really, you know, uh, 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 you know, really feel about, you know, helping, you know, a, a new startups, you know, uh, uh, and, and that's very important for Snowflake. We have, we were a startup yesterday and we want to help new startups. So, so the end, the idea of this program, the, the other aspects of, of, of that program is also to help, you know, startup to build on top of Snowflake and to enrich, you know, this, this very, you know, rich ecosystem that Snowflake is or the data cloud, our data cloud is. And, and, and we want to, you know, help and boost, you know, that, that excitement for the platform. So, so the ends, you know, it, it's a win-win. It's a win, you know, uh, for, for new startups and it's a win, of course, for us because it will make the platform even better. Yeah, and startups are where innovation happens. Yeah. So registration's open. Uh, I've heard uh, several have, uh, startups have, have signed up. You go to uh, snowflake.com slash startup challenge and, and you can learn more. Uh, that's exciting uh, program and initiative. So th thank you for doing that on behalf of, of, of the startups yeah. out there. And, and thanks Benoit and Christian. I yeah. uh, really appreciate you guys coming on. Great conversation. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thank and, you, Dave. You know, you're welcome. And when, when we talk to uh, go to market pros, they always tell us that one of their key tenets is to stay close to the customer. Well, we want to find out how data helps us to do that. And our next segment brings in two chief revenue officers to give us their perspective on how data is helping their customers transform businesses digitally. Let's watch. 